So are we ready to begin? We're ready to begin? Okay, we're ready to begin. Now everyone is in the suburbs here. And it's nice, but um, it would be even nicer if you could move up a little bit. You, nobody should be in the first row. I know you don't want to be, but unless you want your, you know, we're, we're taping this. Unless you want to be taped, you don't want to be in the first row. But if you could just move up a little bit because there are about 18 people. Just so I can see you, my eyesight is not the greatest. And I'm thinking, I don't want to think that you're a log or something, you know? That would be, I appreciate this. I know this is hard. It's like in a church service, having people move up slightly is always difficult. But I have a feeling we will do better. Oh, and it actually looks like we have people now. My gosh, this is exciting. We have a real quorum now. I think we have about 20. But you look much more substantial when you're closer together, I must say. Uh. Okay. Yeah, yes. If you, okay, if you need something, Michael is here for us. Okay. Thank you for moving up a little bit. Good. Um, before we begin, I, I will move back here, you know, when we begin, because I'm supposed to be on camera or something or other. But um, I wanted to also sometimes ask you know, for some input. Now, you're not going to probably even be heard. If I can remember, I'll, I'll repeat the question. But um, I want to make it a little bit interactive. Uh, it could be maybe more interesting. I don't know. Maybe to begin with, I'm wondering uh, what people's background might be. And if you could just, you know, just sort of mention your name and um, let us know where you're coming from. Your, not your blood type, but almost everything else would be fine. Uh, just a few things. And I'm Rosalie Otters, and I'm uh, an associate professor here at UALR in the School of Social Work. And I've just begun um, as the uh, program coordinator for the gerontology program, which is in the School of Social Work. And you may wonder what this has to do with whatever you're learning. I don't exactly know what you're learning. But it has a lot to do with what you're learning because people age from, from the time they're born to the time they die. Age is an extremely interesting variable. People age out of foster care. They age out of um, different sports because you're too old if you're not a teenager in, 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 as a gymnast. You know, all this kind of people age out and get they either make it or they're too old or they're too young or too fat or too something. But often age is a variable where you're in or you're out for lots and lots of things. And so it doesn't just begin when you're 66 now for Social Security. If you're a baby boomer, you have to be at least 66 or 67. No more 65 if you're a baby boomer. But that's not the only you know, issue. And so it doesn't begin at a certain age that suddenly you wake up one day and, oh, I'm old. Now, that doesn't really happen, even though you may think it happens. So uh, throughout life, we're, you know, there are things that we age into and we age out of. So I want to talk about um, families and how uh, developmentally individuals and families keep on moving on through this life course understanding. And the life course is a very interesting understanding because it's not only an understanding of how you psychologically you know, get older as Erickson's different stages of life. But life course talks about the times you live in. And I'll go through some of this all over again when we get, go through the, um, the um, PowerPoints. But uh, life course deals with um, if you were born, for instance, as a baby boomer from 1946 to 1964, it would deal with what would be the big thing, the big war that would probably, you'd be, you know, coming of age. Vietnam, right. That colored and does color everything you look at in many, many ways. And if you were uh, born, say, 1920, when my father was born, you would be colored by World War II and the Depression. And so life course also speaks about the social times that you live in. It's not enough just to talk about what's happened to you psychologically. It's more of a sociological understanding. And actually, my background is in sociology as well as social work. So that's sort of where I'm coming from and what I'm really interested because in, I find it really very fascinating. And I'm wondering what your name is and what you're about. My name is Hayes Miller. I work for the Family Service Agency. And I manage a program called the Regional Prevention Provider Program. My area of specialty is program development and assisting people with 
implementing projects, activities, and services on drug prevention for the lifespan. All right, it's for the lifespan, so it's not just at any one age. That's correct. You're in the right place. Because, and really, people who are not in here are, would be in the right place if they came here because we deal with everything. All right, okay. I'm um, Scotty Manning. I work with tobacco prevention and cessation. And I work with Master Settlement and I manage tobacco brands. And I manage all different ages and focuses on different ages for prevention or cessation. You're in the right place, definitely, too. I mean, this is really exciting. Good. Yes. Hi, I'm Amy Bradshaw. Um, currently, I'm staying at home with my little girl, Josie Grace. But prior to that, I was working in community mental health clinic setting, and I've also done inpatient work. So. Okay. With what ages? The whole gamut. whole gamut. Yeah. Okay. Well, probably eight and up, actually. Okay. Didn't do a lot of work with the real time ones. Okay. Eight and up at children. Working with children. And adults. And adults. Uh, and, and adults who are older? Also elderly. Okay, okay. So just that whole from Whole range, whole That's range. Right. Okay, uh, okay, good, okay. Um, I guess go here. I'm Rhonda Lance, and I'm actually an alcohol drug counselor uh -huh. here in Little Rock, but I also, I don't live here, I live in Fairfield Valley, and I'm in nursing, I'm a private nursing with um, a client that has a brain injury and he was in the, he was in the military person I take care of him also so and I, I've been all through a class because I just want to go I just want to you want a break <laughs> well you're in the right place too I've been through all the rest of it, yeah. okay good yes oh very good Yes. I'm Kathy Berg. I'm a mostly retired mental health clinician after many years. And uh, eight years ago, we built a multi generational house with my parents, and so I've been a primary caregiver for eight years. Oh. Now, is that, all right, so is that house nearby your family's house? Or the whole household is a multi generational household? Yes. Okay, well, then you may have some interesting experiences to share because. This was originally t entitled The Rise of the Multi-Generational Family. There is a rise in, in people who are either two or three generations or even more living together. Okay, good. Yes. Uh, I'm Sean Oakley. I'm a social worker working as a mental health therapist for Birch Tree Communities, um, which is adults 18 and up. So How old is old there? Okay, so all kinds of ages. Good. Okay. Yes. Hi, my, my name is Jan Mobs. I also work with Birch Street Communities. Uh, this is my <coughs> seventeenth year. Uh, most of it has been in administration, writing uh, reviews and Medicaid clinical reports. But I'm back out in the field now, uh -huh. in direct care, um, with the same as Sean. But the, the main reason I chose this was because. We now have my mother, who is 94, living with us, and we're also caring for some of our grandchildren. And so there's a span of ages uh, from 2 to 94 that live with us in our home from time to time. So I just thought it would be something that, would be, that I could learn from. All right, so you're living the experience. Yes. That's, well, then you may have some things to say, too. Not that other people won't. Good. Yes. Well, especially important when uh, people, um, many people may have, uh, generations may go for maybe 15, 20 years. It may be very short duration, and then you're into a new generation. So um, you may really have to be talking to some people who are grandparents or great-grandparents, as you're saying, 
and then they may have Social Security, they may have Medicare, Medicaid issues where they need help. Um, we really need to know more about the, the other things that um, could make life a lot easier for people. Good. Yes. Oh, okay, so even if you're dealing with children, you're still in the background can be these families that are multi-generational. Okay, okay. Now I know I did you, but I didn't do you, did I? Hello, okay. my name is Myrtle M. Johnson. I have a background in social work as well as vocational rehabilitation counseling. And uh, I am here to learn more uh, about the return of the multi-generational family since I am quickly approaching that time as well as have a multitude of generations living um, with one or more family members. So mm -hmm. I, th I think it's interesting. It will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, we're in a very interesting time of great diversity right now. Yes. And um, some of it could be very interesting, very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Misty Knighton, my background is school psychology and I'm working in public schools. Okay, so you see not only children, but you're seeing their parents. Now, are some of the parents older? Some of them. Or grandparents? Are, some of them. Ah, so great, we're hearing that parent, great parents, great parents, great, great parents, um, and great, great, whatever. So there's a whole number of generations here that we're talking about. And I think you're about the third or fourth person who said that. So that's good. Okay, yes. Karen Kizeski, I am also a school psychology specialist in public school, uh, mainly special ed assessment and evaluation. And we do deal a lot with parents, grandparents, and uh, the family kind of as, as a unit with the child's disabilities. So. Okay, good. So another longitudinally parents, great grandparents, great grandparents, etc. So it's a whole course of the life. And in my situation, I have also lived with my elderly parents and my daughter and her grandkids. Oh, so you're living the experience also. So you're at least the third person living the experience yeah. too. Okay, then you're a devil. <laughs> Double whammy here. Good. Okay, next. Uh, Jimmy Webb, my background, I'm a registered nurse. I work at Arkansas Health Center, one of the largest nursing homes in the state. We do have mental health residents there. Difficult residents to place. Uh, I just thought it was a good topic. Okay. A lot of people that are experiencing. Okay. So, and on a personal level, you know people, but also maybe it's a good topic. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, so maybe there are personal issues as well as what you see at work. Okay. Yes. Um, Kim Wolf, I'm a licensed social worker at the Arkansas Health Center um, for behavioral health nursing home. I work on an all women's um, behavioral unit. Our residents are, I have a resident 46 to 82. Okay. Well, the older adult, according to AARP, is age what? AARP, what do they say the older adult is? 50, that's what they say. And that's when you can become a member of AARP at age 50. And I would say there are some reasons for that. You know, okay. Yes. I'm Crystal King and I also work at the Arkansas Health Center. Um, my background is in social services. Um, I used to be with children and families, but now I'm working with adults. I'm on the male psych unit. And we have um, residents ranging from in their 20s to Okay, another example. Wow. Okay, yes. Uh, my name is Vicki Lawrence, and I work in private practice, uh, providing services to DHS clients who have foster care, protective services cases, or the And I, too, am living in a multi generational family. 
Okay, we, we ought to have a sign. I am living in multiple gen <laughs> multi-generational families. Okay, I'm the living proof. Somebody came in here? Right here, ma'am. Oh, okay, yes. My name is Lawanda Lewis. My background is in social work. I have a work history of working in mental health as a therapist, uh, hospice as a social worker, and hospice as a chaplain. Okay, so you also probably see quite a number of people at different age, especially maybe the older, but there's, there are people that are younger too in hospice, right? Okay, yes, Dr. Bell Tolliver. Hello. Hello. Well, uh, I'm not sure of everything that you're saying, but uh, I work here at UALR and I also work with Vicky over here at HLH Consultants where we see clients that, are, that have Well, I think, you know, you're another example, Dr. Bell Tolliver, another example of living the story. So we have a number, that we have at least five or six people who are living the story, maybe more, and you may be living the story and you don't realize it even, you know, depending upon how you want to define the story. So um, we want to know, it sounds like we have nurses here, we have people from psychology, we have social workers, is something else, another group? Those are the groups I think we're thinking of. And we're talking about aging um, in terms of, um, you know, for professional reasons, we'd like to understand this better because of, um, we have people at all kinds of ages, and then also because of, for personal reasons. And I think I often find, when you get into gerontology, there are a lot of personal reasons. That's sort of, um, it, it just really happens that way. Let's see if we can do this. Oh, yeah, okay. How do you define family? This is something, uh, it's a, um, understanding a family can be um, as easy or as difficult as uh, you want to make it. And I think now, even as I said before, we're in a time of a lot of change, a changing understanding of what family is about. When I grew up in the 1950s and early 1960s, uh, family was pretty, um, well defined. I'm the oldest of seven children. I knew I was the oldest of seven children and I knew what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to be that oldest sister and um, you know it, you just and I think I remember going to college and being asked how many children you know what kind of a family life would you have? I don't know why they were asking these things but I thought I would have five children. Now in the end I had two children and uh, many people I know in my extended family are not having children. Uh, we really have come in, into a very different, different, uh, different understanding of what family is about, and yet extended family is very important for you know even my siblings who may or may not have have children of their own, and I'm not a grandmother at this point because my children have decided there are more important things to do, and so, so uh, you know and then I get asked, well of course you have five, ten, you know grandchildren, no, no, uh, it really we're in a different time. And I don't know if that's all a bad time, but it's very different. So how you define family, it may be you define family because of who you are biologically related to, which is very much the way I see it. And usually a week doesn't go by that I don't hear from at least one sibling. You know, something is happening, because as the oldest, you have all these things that you're sort of um, uh, listening to. I, I don't know how I got to be the older sister story because I tried to give that story away to a younger sibling, but she died. And so now I have that job. So I get to, you know, sort of, um, sort of referee some of these things, which I, I don't quite understand how that ever happened. So I am quite busy with family um, in many, many ways. And when I go to New York, I go there every year, I get to also see a brother who I'm the guardian for because he has uh, a mental illness. And uh, they're very happy, the rest of the family, to let me do this, not them. Uh, they're, yes, it, it's okay. And so I get to see him every year and try to get other people to do other little things because from Arkansas, it's hard to see him more than that. So how I define family is a very extended understanding. You may define family a bit differently. 
uh, often we might think of family in terms of a three generational family and here we can see that um, this family is very much a three generational family but there are not as many children as you might um, think in the past I mean if my, we talked about my three generational family because uh, I grew up in a three generational family uh, we didn't just have children I, my grandmother lived with us until I was um, I don't know 14 I think and then she died and in fact in remembrance of her I, I went and I looked at some jewelry that I had because I'm not a jewelry person but uh, when my grandmother um, my grandmother would tell us a lot of stories my sister and I who were the oldest and her stories were of Brooklyn and she had when she was when I was very little her stories were uh, stories that she could read to us also so she read some horrifying Greek legends about people's eyes being taken out I love these stories they were just great and gory or Bible stories like Samson which is not much better here uh, if you remember what happened to Samson um, uh, but I really like those kind of stories and she also though as she got um, even older she started to lose her eyesight and she developed macular degeneration where she couldn't see in the center of her eyesight and she became very depressed especially when we moved out to Long Island because we had been in Brooklyn till I was about five and then we moved out to Long Island and she became very depressed and she would show um, my sister and I my sister Lorraine and I some of her jewelry and she would go through each piece and she'd say how I'm going to give this to you I'm going to give this to you when I die <laughs> when I die well I'm wearing two of her pieces today because I never wear these things and I didn't even realize that this little piece I have here is actually a shamrock it's a four-leaf clover she was Irish Catholic it goes together I mean I never connected anything that there was anything connected um, that was ethnic or anything you know and then she, she had this rhinestone necklace. I never wore that either. So I thought I, in honor of my grandmother, my grandmother Pauline Murphy McGovern, very Irish sounding names, uh, who was, you know, in midlife, be, uh, really before women even got to, to vote, my grandmother was very old even when I was little. She was always ancient. And truly, um, she was born in 1874. It's so far back, it's like, who can ever remember? I just remember how it was so far back. It still is, even further back now. And she would have been God knows how many years old if she was still living. But she always impressed me with her age, but also when I was little with the stories, that she would tell me these stories. My mother didn't have much time at that point. My mother in Brooklyn was having a lot of children, and she just didn't have much time for other things. Plus, she was sick most of the time with morning sickness so I remember my grandmother and her great stories and I'm thinking of her now so moving on here multi-generational families um, the US Census says that three or more generations living under the same roof would be uh, considered a multi-generational family as you just saw but you can also have the Pew Research also has a different understanding you could have only two generations maybe with a young adult and maybe an older adult as middle-aged adult or you could have a grandparent and then maybe young children so you, you don't have to even have three generations um, and then the question always comes up can you have a multi-generational family if they don't exactly live in the same household and that we're going to think about because there are lots of plans and lots of um, new things that are happening where people uh, will make uh, sometimes constructing um, temporary housing on a property and they won't live um, you know the children won't be living with the older adult but they'll be on the same property so in, and you may consider that a multi-generational unit in some ways and I think that happens more and more now. Types of multi-generational families. Um, well, many of these families are ethnic multi-generational families. Now, I told you that my background is very much Irish Catholic, and that's really for a reason, because I have noticed that in Arkansas, if you're not African American, you're black. No, you're just, you're, you, it's like it goes into the void. Oh. <laughs> you're the default you're and the default I guess it's white but I don't even know what it is and I guess I grew up in a in a place especially Brooklyn and even going out to Long Island everyone was ethnic something and
and you know, and then it got more homogenized. So today, I don't think you see some of those, you know, different ethnicities. But when I was growing up, my mother still had an Al Smith button from 1929. Who was Al Smith? He what? He ran for president. He was Irish Catholic from New York City, and he lost big because he was perceived as being Catholic. It was very anti, you know. So uh, it wasn't until Kennedy that really being Irish Catholic was okay. But in the 1800s, being Irish Catholic, they would have signs in the bars that said, no Irish or dogs allowed. And you really need to understand that because I think the Irish Catholic need to understand that too because it was a very difficult time. And I wouldn't say that there are any difficulties now or at all in comparison to what that past is, but I think we need to know our past. And so all the nursery rhymes and little things that I remember from my grandmother, they're perhaps important. It's a bygone time, but also an important time. And it, in the time that she grew up, and even when my mother grew up, the Irish were perceived as being a little bit different. And even in New York, they were a little different. And so now, things are more homogenized and you become white. But, and it's unfortunate when people become white, which is just a label, uh, because the Irish weren't white at one point, but when you become white, you end up forgetting people who have gone through difficult times themselves, and you just end up being a bit superior about that. So in Arkansas, what I would wonder with you is if you have a, uh, whatever your last name is, even if you're black, you may be Irish. Uh, you may very well be Irish. And the Irish came in through New Orleans, coming up from the New Orleans port up here to Arkansas. And they were very, very backward and very poor. They came up from the potato famine. And it was all right at that time in the early 1800s, or middle 1800s, to uh, get a free Irishman you know, to work in the swamps around New Orleans. Because you know, if they died, it didn't matter. But if you had an African-American slave die, that was property. So they had a hard scrabble story. Unfortunately, I can't say they've always been good about that hard scrabble story. But maybe it's important to know your history and know your story. So all of you, I would say, have some story, some ethnic story, which it's good to know about. As my husband says, because his mother's middle name was Willoughby, and then he found out that uh, she would always, she was into genealogy. And she would say that there was some ancestor, Willoughby, who had to make a quick exit from Great Britain because he was about to be hung if he didn't. So you may find out that you have cattle wrestlers and God knows who in your background, but you might also find out, like uh, Louis Gates, who has written a lot about um, you know, uh, genograms and origins of African Americans, and I think he traces his own history back to Irish kings at, on one end. So you never know. So you just never know. And I've seen so many people with the names, certainly Murphy and McGovern, and I always feel akin somehow because even though my father was not Irish Catholic, I grew up with those stories. And so, you know, you identify with something. So I would say that that's important. And um, my mother herself really grew up in a multi-generational family because she ended up having a number of uncles or aunts coming in and, or even grandfather coming in and out of the family at different times. And because my grandfather was a doctor, he was a little bit more able to take care of some of these people who were drifting in and out. Because many of them didn't have children, though he had five children, I guess four living, to grow up. So uh, having extended families in my family is not that new. Though I have to say right now, there's just my husband and myself. So ethnicity is important to multi-generational families because when you first come uh, to um, you know, the United States or you, whatever it may be, or America or whatever, you may have to all work together to be able to sort of eke things out. And certainly if you uh, didn't want to come to the United States, or your ancestors had no desire to do that, you were indentured uh, as a white person, or you were indentured who wasn't perceived particularly as white, or you were, in, you were a slave as an African American, um, that would also be very difficult uh, for you. So um, we have to think here that the different kinds of multi-generational families, um, there is a, one thing that we have to wonder about is when, can, when do you become an adult? 
and adulthood is something that is actually a, a moving target. How old would you think you need to be to be an adult? If you're thinking about it chronologically, how old? Anybody? What is an adult? 18 because? Yeah, you get certain privileges, and if it's not 18, you know, whether it's voting or, you know, there are other things that you, I guess, dr drinking in some states or other states you're 21, but this is an entree into certain things, certain privileges and maybe responsibilities, or to go, get into the military, things like that, and do that without apparent consent or, you know, waiver or something like that. Um, so we can say that it's these ages, but actually it's a moving target. Aging um, has come to uh, change everything in our society. People are living longer. A hundred years ago, people lived on average just into maybe the early 40s because so many babies died uh, and so many women died in childbirth. In fact, my grandmother would tell me that on her side of the family, both her mother and uh, her mother's mother, everyone, and her, I guess her husband, my grandfather's mother, they died in childbirth. This was very, very common 100 years ago. And so it made the age of, um, of you know, of, of the average age really went down quite a bit. Um, but now we have a lot of, under, a different understanding where they have a, adolescence seems in some ways to be prolonged or even be given a new word. Sometimes they call it in psychology, have you heard emerging adulthood in psychology? You who are in psychology, anybody? Emerging adulthood? And that sort of is an understanding that it is a moving target that people today, young people today, it's, they may be late teens, even into early, late 20s or early 30s, still trying to put pieces together. Because when we think of what it means to be an adult, we usually think that you can take up responsibilities. You can, you can take up financial responsibilities, and maybe you will ha be able to take up responsibilities at some level to care for others, whether you have your own children, or whether you're caring for other relatives, or whether you're caring, you know, in, just in a general sense. Uh, some sort of generativity understanding at some level. Um, so th that's sort of what we're wondering about here, and there'll be more on that. We can also have adult children coming home uh, because of they're not quite able to make it. They could be 25, even 30, and maybe financially um, they can't make it. They lost their job, or maybe they got divorced. Maybe they're coming back with a child in tow, or maybe they want to go back to school. So there are lots of reasons. And then there are also older adults, and I'm saying 50 plus. I know that's really hard for people to stomach, 50 plus. But I think it's very important to think about uh, older adulthood as beginning at 50 and thinking about what this means because we're talking about from age 50 to maybe 105. The oldest person I ever worked with was 105. And, you know, we, they could be even older. But I'm saying that you have about three generations in this older adulthood. It's a vast wasteland the way we look at it now. And uh, we really need to sort of, you know, sit up and take notice. And one group of older adults would be from about age 50 to about age 70, maybe. And maybe, and, but, you know, ages, numbers are just sort of strange. And maybe then a middle uh, older age might be 70 to 85, maybe. And maybe the fastest growing group percentage-wise is those over 85. It's, you know, I think, is it uh, Willard Scott, who does all the birthdays or something in NBC? Um, I think that he is going to have a lot of trouble in, in, in ensuing years of trying to say happy birthday to people who are 100. There are just more and more of them. But this, somebody who is 100 has very little in common with somebody who is 50. You know, and this really needs to be refined quite a bit. Uh, a reason that we talk about older adulthood beginning at age 50 is because of, does anyone have any thoughts? AARP tells you, but what else? What happens at age 50 or about? Menopause, Menopause that's, you know, that's interesting because I didn't think about that, but that's true, <laughs> right? Right? What else? 
the older worker, it's harder to get a job when you're in your late 40s, early 50s. It becomes simply more difficult. Those who lost a job in the recession, the Great Recession we're calling it now, they had more trouble, they do have more trouble getting back and, and certainly getting the same amount of money that they were getting before. The older worker has many, many issues, and that's one reason I think that AARP, it really centers a lot of their work on older workers. Another reason you think about 50 plus is because at the age of 50, it is easier to get disability payments. Um, so that if you had a problem in your job, some physical disability, or it could be a mental health disability that's long term, if you're age 50, they think that it will be harder to retrain you. Uh, this is the traditional understanding. And so it's easier to get disability payments. I wouldn't go out of my way to do this, but I think that that's another reasoning. And then simply, some people have much harder lives. Though who, those who come from a um, homeless environment or a lower class environment, they don't live as long, they have a harder time, and a, their health is not as good. And they really they often can't make it, you know, um, as long as many people who are more advantaged. So these are some reasons that you really want to think about that. And I think there is a lot of things that we could be doing for people ages 50 on up, you know, uh, until the time they finally get Social Security, which now, as I said, is age 66 or 67. Though most people, I think, continually um, continue to take Social Security at 62, that is starting to change. And more people are starting to work a bit longer. But this is also, under this understanding, of it, it's a little bit more difficult when you're older to get that next job, or even sometimes to, con to maintain the job that you have. So um, you may have an older adult moving to a child's home, and of course it's not as common, but people can get Alzheimer's even in their 50s, though it's more rare. Uh, so they may have health issues too. So there could be financial issues, there could be life changes, uh, there could be a divorce, there could be many reasons. The rise of the multi-generational family in 1980, I don't know if you can see this very well, but it's from the Pew um, Research Center. In 1980, 11% of our population um, was in a multi-generational family, and of course they define it as two or more generations. And now it has gone up to 15% in 2008. And so it's gone from, um, and some of these numbers are a little hard to understand because it looks like whether it's 19, here it looks like 1970, but I think it's around 1970, 1980, it depends upon how you want to, um, to figure out the numbers. There was, you know, the, uh, there were fewer people at, at that time, between 1970 and 1980, who were in a multi-generational family. It was only 26, 28 um, million. And now it's 49 million. This is still not a huge number, but it's been increasing. And I think one reason it's been increasing because of our financial issues, but also we have, uh, as you have immigrants, they're more likely, ethnic, ethnicity comes into the fore, and they're more likely to be in a multi-generational family. Um, so, as I said before, age is something, um, it's such an interesting variable. This is a very interesting time. And studying gerontology, what I'm really telling you about today is social gerontology. It's a whole course. And uh, we're just doing one little piece about multi-generational families. But gerontology is interesting. It's interesting because if you're fortunate, you all have a chance to get to be part of this story. And if you don't have a chance, well, you're not going to be around. But it w wouldn't it be better? We prepare for so many things, and yet when it comes to age, we're so fearful of things. Uh, there are so many things that we can do for ourselves as well as others. And I think to begin with, we want to look at things in a much more longitudinal way, rather than just cutting up things in very, you know, because you're a certain number. Uh, so what does age have to do with it? There are numerous ways in social gerontology to look at age. and. Um, I have, th this was something that I studied at North Texas in uh, gerontology, it was, it was the study of aging at gerontology, that was one of my areas, and the other area was health, um, and it was in sociology, but I just find this so interesting, because it deals with me, and with you, and with everybody, and there are more choices today than ever before, if you sort of can figure things out. 
So what has age got to do with it? Well, one, we can look at age as a chronological number. So I am 50. That's it. I'm 50. We can also look at it as having a biological understanding. I am 50, but you know, I don't really take care of myself, and I'm probably 65, 70, 80, I mean, my heart, everything is failing, etc. Or the reverse, I'm age 50, but I work out, I do this, I eat right, and, and I, had, I come from a family where they live long, because it's not just what you do, it's also the family. If you, if you had been smart enough to make sure that you came to the right family when you were born, then that does, that does help, that does help. Uh, I'm sure everyone is taking notes on that. Next time, right, next life, okay. Psychological age, I have a lot of stress. I may be 50, but I don't know if I can do this. And I think the, you know, the biological and the psychological can sort of intertwine. It's hard to give numbers to these things, but you can see where I'm going. And then there's the social age. You can live in a time that's very difficult. Um, my uncle, my Uncle Louie, everyone should have an Uncle Louie. My Uncle Louie was my, fa my grandfather's oldest child. He was born in 1907 or something, and he was much older than my mother. And he was born at the wrong time. He was really born at the wrong time, because when he was a young man, uh, suddenly he got, you know, at the end of his teenage years, what happened? The, you know, the depression. He never, ever was able to get beyond that depression story. He had to leave, I think he started college someplace, and he had to leave, and he just worked. And that's all he could do the rest of his life. Um, my father, who was born later, maybe 10 years or more later, he had a difficult time, but he was very young during the Depression. And so then he was in World War II, and he got a GI Bill of Rights, you know, all this money. He went to college, all this. It was a different story. But if you're born at the wrong time, it's really hard. So the social age is very important. I'm teaching uh, social aspects of death and dying now online. And we just had to, um, to write our um, two obituaries, and one was for ourselves. And you know, even though I said, give me the social times and the environment, you know, tell me about your culture, I didn't get anything back often. A few people did, but most people didn't. Because we think of everything in very psychological, individualistic terms. But this is one time you really need to look at the bigger picture. Because if, you're in a, if you live in a time when it's very hard to get a job, or even as we just came oh, you know, through this recession, the Great Recession, we we're calling it, it's not as easy to get that job. It's not easy to move on. People who are, I have children who are in their 30s now, and they are still struggling to try to put things together. And I think that's one reason. They, they can just about you know, chew gum and walk. They, they don't want to have more things that they have to do. And so the time you live is very important. So you put this all together in a mixer, and you, and you spit out an age. I don't know what the age would be. But you can see that age is more than just a number. It's, a, it's sort of a composite understanding of a number of different uh, aspects of who you are. The 20th century, I think the reason this is such an interesting century is because we're talking about age in terms that because you're age 60, you can do more things, not less things. Or because you're age 50, you know, there are more openings that we don't just make because you're a, chronologically a certain number that you can't do things. Uh, if you look at old movies, they have people who are really perceived as old, 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 old when they're 40 plus. I mean, old. You know, they can hardly move or something. And the kind of granny cl uh, clothes that they wear, because I remember my grandmother, she had granny shoes and granny glasses, and she had her hair in a bun, you know, and she had false teeth. I mean, she was ancient, ancient forever and ever. So you don't see that as much, even when people are, you know, when she was in her 80s, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, Methuselah here, or whatever the feminine version would be, there she was. So um, this is a time of integration, of possibilities. But I think it's only a time of possibilities if we really want the possibilities. If we don't talk about what we can do, rather than what we can't do at certain ages, we won't necessarily have many more uh, opportunities. Um, 
we to think of those who the boomerang generation have you heard of that term boomerang all right boomerang of course you think of the Australian you know um, tool weapon I guess you know it goes out this way and then it comes back and it hits you in the face or something um, they talk about the boomerang generation as those who are part of this emerging adulthood they left home and then they boomerang right back home and also, also um, well, often they are a part of what they call Generation X and Y. And I'm going to go through those in a little bit. But Generation X begins around 1983 uh, to about 1999. Generation, um, oh no, that was Generation X is, is 1965, 1982. And then Generation Y, who follows them, 1983 to 1999. Um, they, they really, um, these generations are marketing tools. In some ways, it's sort of silly to have all these little, you know, the way they slice and dice things. But in other ways, it's perhaps important to realize that the experiences your children or maybe yourself are going through may not be the same as those who either came before you or after you. So the boomerang generation, they're basically the generation X and Y. They're younger than baby boomers while the baby boomers would be more what they call the sandwich generation where there are these, these middle-aged adults born 1946 to 1964 and they are sandwiched between their adult children and it may even be their grandchildren on one hand and then on the other hand you know those who are older than they are you know who we call seniors uh, there is a distinction between baby boomers and seniors, which we'll talk about too. It's, it's very confusing at times. But I noticed this when I um, looked at the advertisements for UAMS. Uh, they were having like a fair day, a health fair day, and they wanted to get people who essentially were probably um, 50 plus. Well, you can't use seniors for people who are 50. They will not take it. They will not tolerate it. So they would talk about baby boomers. They had some advertisements that said, baby boomers, this is what you need to do. And then they had another, and they would talk about, you know, whatever, you know, they had some rock person or this or that, you know, personality coming. And then they had another advertisement that would talk about seniors, you need to do this. And we have bingo, <laughs> you know. So they had two separate understandings and they tried to market it separately so older adults aren't even just one little piece anymore and I'm saying that we could make three generations here but there are at the very least two gener there are two terms that we seem to use because baby boomers if you talk about 50 plus every baby boomer is over 50 now every baby boomer so I've been waiting for this moment so I could say this because nobody wants to listen when baby boomers are 40, 45, oh, oh, oh. But now, the baby boomer this year, the lowest age is 51. They go from 51 to 69, and next year, baby boomers hit the jackpot. They hit 70. So there is no more fooling around, guys. This is happening, right? So um, in terms of integration, we have to think about financial issues. We do sometimes think too much of what everyone is doing, and, but we have to think about what do I need, what do I want to have happen, and what is family for me. And historically, we've been a very mobile society, but maybe too mobile. But in terms of how can I make it happen, my, one of my sisters, I have all these sisters, I still have, how many? I have two sisters, one sister died. I can't count right sometimes. But my sister Annie, my sister Annie is my, um, I, I use her to sort of figure out what's happening in the real world. She's uh, a few years younger than me, and she um, owes money. Now, I'm sure none of you do, but she does. And she is trying her very best after the recession, the Great Recession, to catch up. And so she was so happy when I told her about some book, and it's, um, it was about Social Security, about how to get what's yours, a very crass title. But uh, it was talking about as, as kind of double dipping, and, you know, where you can get Social Security for yourself uh, if you're the spouse, and then you can, and then your husband would stop getting it, or you know, you can get it for yourself as the spouse, but then you can stop that so that when you you get to the full Social Security age, you can get it for yourself. Yeah. 
but it, it, it's a very popular book. It's in the New York Times. It's everywhere. And so um, this, was a, this was a revelation for her. She needs some money, so I can't feel too badly about her. But um, needing, trying to start planning is a really important thing. And you know, even if you belatedly start, you know, when my sister is starting, at least she's starting, you know, and she's doing it. And th that's, a, that's an important thing. And for the people that you're working with, there may be some simple things that they can do uh, for themselves. And of course, one thing, it's, it can be very confusing, but it'd be really good if you work with anybody who is 60 plus. Find out about Social Security. Try to understand whether people should get it at 62, 66, 67. If you're 65, you have to be older in, in your 70s to have gotten it that way. Because I think before 1943, I think you couldn't get, you know, after 1943, you can't get it until you're 66 or something like that. Anyway, baby boomers, I know I have to be 66. Baby boomers have to wait till they're 66 or 67. Well, you, since, now this is a little off the subject. I've heard that if you have a student loan, that you have to pay off, that, uh, that you can't get your social security? With the government? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. But, but you see what I'm saying? Find out. Now is the time to find out. And when you find out, let me know, because somebody will need to know that. Twenty years. Yep. Okay. You see how important these questions are. Later. <laughs> the, the other thing that I found with in these kind of classes, what I what I found in these kind of classes is that um, I think I, if even if you're divorced, you can get Social Security from your husband or your ex-husband if you've been married. I think ten years or something. Yeah. Listen, some of these things were revelations to people in my class. <laughs> and these are important basic things. You need to know these things. And maybe the people you're working with need to know these. Okay. So do you tell how old you have? <laughs> do I? I'll tell you how old you have. Okay. Well, let's keep on going. Okay. Let's keep on going. <laughs> I don't really want... <laughs> I'm just talking about your chronological. Life. That's right, my chronological. <laughs> That's right. No, but see, if I tell you that, then we have er the whole discussion is about a number. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's why we're not doing it. Okay. Now, I love this baby boomer story. Your mother, or actually it's emerging adulthood story. Your um, mother and I have been talking, and we think it's probably time you got your own place. All right, so this could be a kid who never left home or who came back and now just doesn't fit anymore. So yeah, there are lots, my husband loves the cartoons and uh, the comics. And on Sunday, he gives me all these comics and, and the, we call them aging comics. Now many of them are not very positive about aging, like uh, cards, you know, greeting cards. You know, you think, oh my gosh, some of the greeting cards. All right, now what if everyone stayed home and people didn't leave home? Then Robert Bella, who was a uh, very well-known sociologist said, however painful the process of leaving home, for parents and children, the really frightening thing for both would be the prospect of never leaving home. Do you think that's true? Maybe it's not. Who would say it's true? A few committed. Who say it's not true? Who don't know? Uh, a lot of people don't know. Well, if, if no one ever left home, it would seem that these households would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And maybe you'd have fewer and fewer children, which you seem to be having anyway. We seem to be having anyway. So I don't know if that's really different. But, um, you know, we want people to leave home and we don't want. I think in, in many ways we're ambivalent. And other societies in the West, other industrial societies are rather ambivalent also. Ambivalent to um, often being rather negative about children staying, ho uh, staying home. Once in a while being a little bit positive about it. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes too. Social networks, interdependence. You, we talk a lot about social networks with Facebook, but social networking is a very interesting thing to learn about. Um, they have, this is actually a kind of sociogram where if you could figure out who was in the middle, you could figure out, you know, you know, how they relate to everybody else. So if you had somebody here, 
you know, how, how do they relate to somebody else? This person here relates to this person by how many degrees of separation, to use another way? Two, right. And all this comes out of sociology. I just have a plug for sociology again. Uh, pl uh, things that we talk about every day, uh, the, uh, Milgram, Stan Milgram was very big on this in terms of how close you are to other people. You may be closer than you think. And in Little Rock, the degree of separation is not that much. I've discovered again and again, right? So social networks, there's a lot of interdependence. And that can be a strength of being in a place like Little Rock. When I, I, I've told people sometimes, well, I was born in Brooklyn, or I grew up in Long Island, and they'll say, you know, I know somebody. And I'm going, there are four million people on Long Island, you know, because it was just like, we don't know. Um, but in Little Rock, you have more of a chance, you know, of, of getting, you know, interconnected. So social networks are very important on how they can be helpful. They can be unhelpful, but they can be very helpful too. How we could be with more with one another. And I think that one thing they're finding with Facebook and some of the other, you know, Twitter, all these things that, that we seem to have today is that people are more in communication. Maybe there's too much communication. Sometimes I don't want to even look at my emails and I don't like tweets because especially when somebody's in the next room, don't tweet me in the next room, right? No. Um, because it's, it's like you have to be on duty 24-7 and there's no let up. And I have two of my brothers in IT and they are on duty 24-7. One works for Citibank and one works for AT&T and they're always on call. They don't have to go to the, to the office supposedly, but the office is wherever they are. And that's not necessarily a very helpful thing. But interdependence. Um, how we are related and how we need to be with one another, that could be something that could be helpful. Could be. Leaving home in the past, in the past there were very, very few and short developmental stages. In fact, adolescence, there wasn't adolescence till the 20th century. The early 20th century, you start to see adolescence and you, you look at old, old movies, like the 1920s, 1930s, you start to see adolescence because of the invention of what? What really created adolescence? The invention of the car. People could be mobile, they could have lover's lanes, they could do this, they could do that, ah, the car, okay? It really changed society quite a bit. So, um, but before that, you know, you really didn't have, people would go from, um, you know, especially if you were in a working class environment, you would go from being a child maybe at about um, 10 and then suddenly you'd be an apprentice or something if you didn't go on. I mean, you had, a, you just didn't have much of an adolescence. And actually, childhood only began in the, I think, the 1700s. Um, there is a very famous, you know, series of books about child, you know, the understanding of modern childhood. and. Uh, before um, the early 1800s, well even the early 1800s, you, it, it was a social class thing. Only those of the higher classes would have childhood. Others would be, you know, as you know, in factories, kids four or five would be, um, you know, they would be turning um, in some of the factory equipment and get hands and limbs cut off and everything. And they would be four, five, six, they were small so they could do it. So this is something that, um, leaving home in the past, people might do very quickly there was very little safety net for anyone who was aged or disabled. Uh, that's why they talk about poor farms or you know all those kind of things. You wouldn't want to be part of that kind of thing. Dr. Yes. Yes, you did, thank you. But I'm gonna go 15 more minutes because we're short, but you're right. And I asked her to tell me because she, did, she wants to make sure we get a break and she's right, right, great girl, okay. Uh, I'm going to stop in 15 minutes, and if I don't stop in 15 minutes, you will again remind me, okay? Because I'm trying to stop right in the middle. I'm going to do that. Um, and by about 1850, about that funny little squiggle sign, my husband loves these signs, um, um, had about 70% of people who were age 65 or older um, were living with their adult children. So most people who were older, if they made it, because most people didn't even make it, but if they made it, they were very often with their adult children. <coughs> and if they didn't have any relatives, then they were really stuck. You know, they would have the poor farm, the workhouse, and, and you couldn't work, you were just in trouble. There was historically uh, a decrease as time went on from 1850 
uh, because there were more opportunities for children and there was less parental authority. So fewer people would, uh, ch children would be around for, um, you know, they might go west, you know, in our mobile society even then. And so they wouldn't be around to, uh, to, uh, to, to be a uh, caregiver for an older parent or even just for them to live with them. Uh, if you were an affluent older person, you know, you had a lot more choices. And immigrants were more likely at this time in the 19th century to live in multi-generational homes. And even as I told you, I'm telling you about that Irish Catholic story in my family, it's the remnant. Because my family, on that side of the family, they came over the potato famine in the 1840s. So it was the remnant of those memories of what they could do. More young adults, 21 plus, 21% uh, plus of, the, of young adults um, are in multi-generational households. Um, this is uh, young adults. It's not now all, you know, in terms of all the uh, households, uh, it's a little bit smaller, but young adults are, that's a fifth of the population, over a fifth of the population. This is very, very common, and you probably have seen a lot of articles uh, on uh, boomeranging, um, you know, of young people, you know, in their 20s, even in their 30s, moving back home. It's been very popular. So you can see that it went, uh, 1940, there was like 20, almost 28 percent of young adults were living in multi-generational households, and then um, 2010, it went up to 21.6, almost 22 percent, but it went, you know, in 1980, it said it was about 11. So it, you know, this is just young adults. So th this is an important area to be really looking at. And those who thought we were just talking about people who are 60 plus or 70 plus because we're talking about multi-generational families, they're wrong. You should tell them that. Okay. Social capital influences culture, uh, the cultural and the family norms. And I think as I've talked to you about this, it is very important to really think of the times that people live in and what they're going through, what the advantages are, and also the disadvantages, because we're in a very diverse society, becoming more diverse, especially in terms of ethnicity, race and ethnicity, but at the same time, we may have more difficulties accepting one another. There are more people immigrating into our country now than I think they really uh, have since uh, maybe the 1920s. You know, growing up for me in the 1950s, 60s, there weren't that many people wandering in, you know, but there are a lot more people wandering in now. There's a lot more diversity, a lot more, many more issues in terms of have, looking at people who are not exactly like me. And that's our challenge right now. Um, social capital, uh, economic benefits that come from preferential treatment and cooperation. Some people have more benefits, more financial benefits or social networking benefits, which is really uh, social capital. Some people have more than others. And um, if you come from a uh, ethnic background, because ethnic backgrounds don't just change over a, a one or two generations. It takes four or five generations often for people who have come from the very lowest to, to sort of move up. And then if you're African American, you have other issues going on, you know, besides that. Um, so it, they're really, um, it could help us to have more of an understanding of our history in a way. And I, maybe one reason I like this is because I once was a history major. So now, now deep down I'm going to tell you, and I once taught social studies. Not too long, but I actually did. So I always like these things. Now everyone else, I've, I've discovered, oh, really? Eyes glaze over. But if you know something about the past, you can uh, change the present as, as you move into the future. It can be very enriching. So um, social capital is really very important. As you move through the life course, you want to think of age, as we've talked about, race, ethnicity, the social class, the culture and beliefs, is, these are very important. Uh, how people, um, I think Durkheim, Emile Durkheim, a great sociologist of the late 19th, early 20th century, he wrote that book, Suicide. You heard of that book? Suicide. And well, no. Well, actually, it's a very interesting book. He took um, data from Germany in the 19th century, and he uh, sort of showed that um, Social integration was very important 
those who uh, were more likely to commit suicide came from a certain area of Germany, usually the northern area, and were less, were more likely to move up, were more individualistic and less communal. Those who were, um, who were more uh, communal, had bigger families, had less education, were less likely, interestingly, to commit suicide. And he divided it by religion. The, the religion piece does not work today at all. Uh, but it was, individualism was more Protestant and smaller families and Catholics were more communal and uh, larger families and they had less education. This is not the story today and, and everyone agrees with everything he said, but it's a very interesting story in terms of social integration and um, if you're not integrated into, the so into society, he said they were certain kinds, you were more likely to have certain kinds of um, suicide that would come out. And uh, if you were integrated into society, even if it wasn't always something that you liked, uh, you were less likely. So that's something too. So moving through the life course, we have lots of opportunities perhaps today, but sometimes I think, uh, with my children even, though it's a very difficult time in many ways economically, in other ways I think there are too many choices and they get a little lost. Thinking that they ought to make, cho or, they, or these choices aren't real or, or something. I don't know if they're, they think they have more choices maybe than they have. Uh, there's something about that and uh, there are things that I would just never have even thought to question, they will question. Well maybe it's, you know, maybe you just have to go with the, you know, the program. But no, we'll question, we'll take a moment out and we'll question this. So it may be that's good, but it could also be overwhelming for people. Um, I always think in terms of, um, there's a certain kind of suicide too, it's called a gnomic suicide where anything goes, there are no norms, and I always, when I do this, because I'm, I teach, I'm teaching, I told you, social aspects of death and dying, and so we go into, there's a whole chapter on suicide. So a gnomic suicide, the example I always give is um, the rebel without a cause in the 1950s with James Dean. They have this, re this big, you know, uh, chicken race, uh, you know, and it's in the middle of the wilderness, and they, it's the first person who uh, jumps out of the car, it's headed towards the cliff. The first person who j jumps out is the chicken, right? And so before they do this, James Dean, this other guy, you know, uh, the other guy, you know, James Dean said, well, why are we doing this? I don't know why we're doing this. And so, uh, so um, you know, the other guy says, Buzz is his name, he says, well, you know, what else, there, there's nothing better to do. Right? This is sort of a gnomic, so we're going we're gonna to do this crazy story, and, he, and indeed he doesn't get off, and he, he gets killed. He jumped, you know, he goes, the car goes right off the cliff, and our hero, James Dean, doesn't, you know, he jumps out, he rolls out, but uh, the other guy doesn't make it. So a gnomic suicide, you know, uh, anything goes. Sometimes regulation is helpful. Sometimes it is important to be integrated into society. So we can be... Thinking about some of this, the life course is a bigger perspective than just developmental life stages. It deals with who you are in time, in a culture, uh, in, in a certain history. And I think that's why it's so important. Okay. I still have five minutes, seven minutes, okay. Uh, this is the population cohorts. The silent generation, that they're supposed to be, now some of these ages, change. If you go online, you will not always see the same numbers, you know, where, where, you know, age from this age to this age, or this year to this year. Silent generation is also called the lucky few, because there weren't many of them. And 1925 to 1945, they had less to argue or fight over in terms of, you know, moving up in society. They had an easier time. Uh, baby boomers is the one group that it seems to be pretty uh, clear that it's 1946 to 1964, though at one point it was 1945. Then that got thrown out. So anybody born 1945, I'm sorry, you can be an honorary baby boomer, but that's about all. So it's, it, that is pretty um, <coughs> clear. Then you have Generation X, which is 1965. It begins fine, but when it ends, it's a little soft, but we're going to say it's 1982. They're also called the baby busters because this generation um, had fewer uh, children. And they're, you know, or it, they, they are a smaller cohort, I think, than the baby boomers. That's what it is. They're a small, smaller cohort. But then Generation Y, eight, 1983 to 1999, sort of, 
They're also called the millennials or the echo boomers. They are actually bigger than the baby boomers in terms of the numbers. Because, but, um, and so when they come through, they'll be something to reckon, be reckoned with. And then Generation Z, also called Generation Next, gener the Google Generation, whatever you want to call it, uh, 2000 on. You can see some of these things are just marketing, but they will make a lot of distinctions. And in the paper, you'll see this all the time. They'll say millennials. They seem to like millennials better than Generation Y. They did this. They did that. They're, you know, they're supposed to do whatever. And then the Generation Z, well, they're supposed to know everything about technology. I don't think that's the case. I, I find out sometimes for e all these generations should be knowing something about technology, at least after the baby boomers. And I'm finding out sometimes I'm a genius with technology. Here I am, because I'm teaching online, and I have people you know, coming to me. I always like that. And I have to explain this, right? Because I took high school typing. That's why. Oh, OK. Well, so, so if you took high school typing, you ought to be able to do online, I guess. I don't know. We're going to stop after I go through this. 1975, this was, there were 40 pictures that was taken, uh, taken in the New York Times. And it was 19, I don't know, I guess 1975 to next 40 years, whatever that is, 19, 2014 or something or other. Anyway, uh, one of these people, um, so this is, these, these are these, um, these young girls and one of them um, was mar is married to somebody who's the photographer in all 40 pictures for each year. At this point, their age is 15 to 25. And I show you maybe three other pictures as time goes on. But right now, who would you say is the youngest and who is the oldest? They're, now, they are definitely baby boomers. Youngest and oldest. Their age is 15 to 25. So there's a 10-year gap here between the oldest and the youngest. All right, the one on the right is what? The youngest. The youngest. All right, what would you say? One on the left is the youngest. Okay. Two in the middle. One in the middle. The middle, the middle left youngest and middle right oldest. Yeah. Okay, let's go with youngest. Make the youngest. Raise your hand if it's this one. All right, I have what? Two, four, uh, three, four. Sorry, can't count. This one? Youngest? Oh, we have two, four, five, six, seven. Seven? Okay. This one? Nobody wants to make her the youngest? Okay. This one? Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have a tie. A eight, I didn't see it. This is winning right now. Okay. And who's the oldest? This one? This one. Okay. We'll find out. We're going to have a break. We'll come back at three. You'll want to come back because we're going to we'll talk about this. Can yeah. you give us the code for this class? Yes. There's a code. Yes, there's a code <laughs> for the class. I have no idea what the code is. What, what do you mean the code for? 